put the recording on. Please. All right. Hello. So my name is Otto, and I'm here to talk about WordPress security. So we just heard a talk about WordPress performance. That's something people are quite often interested in, and security is another very common topic around WordPress. So I'm the CEO for a company called Serava. I'm from Finland, and I have a very strong Linux and open source background. I've uh, contributed to many of the software in the, I've contributed to WordPress core, but also to many of the other pieces of software used in the WordPress stack. And uh, it's kind of partially my hobby to go, go around to Word, Word camps and educate people on be best practices around performance and security. And uh, some of you might have seen my talk on WordPress Security 101. I've had that at pretty many WordCamps. And that is about how to, what, what, what to do to make your WordPress site secure, because there's quite a lot of false advice out there. If you Google for WordPress security, you will quite easily end up on sites saying that install these 10 plugins and then you're secure. And that's usually false advice. So I recommend you check out that talk. It's on WordPress TV. And if you search for my name on WordPress TV, you will probably find lots of other interesting talks as well. But today, I'm not going to talk about how to secure your WordPress site. Today, I'm going to talk about what happens when your WordPress site has been hacked, when there is a security breach and specifically about the case that happened exactly a year ago on November 9th. So our company is focused on doing upkeep for WordPress sites. It means that we are a hosting company, but, but we're more than that. We also monitor all of our customer sites 24 seven. We take care of caching and backups and security. And Included in our upkeep is that we guarantee that if a site gets hacked while we maintain it, then we will also clean it up for free. So then that's a pretty good guarantee for customers that they know that we take security seriously because if we need to clean up a site, then we won't make any profit for it for many years. And this story is about one of our customers who got hacked and how we how we cleaned it, how we investigated it, and how we cleaned up the site. How many of your, you have experience that your WordPress site has been hacked? Whoa, that's way too many. <laughs> I hope you have lots of WordPress sites and that's the reason. <laughs> yeah, but unfortunately it happens. WordPress has historically not such a good security record. Nowadays, WordPress core is very good and very secure and it has a big security team. But uh, there are like 60,000 plugins out there. And most of the security issues nowadays are because of vulnerabilities in the plugins. And WordPress is very popular and the plugins are very popular. There's lots of people attacking WordPress sites. So I don't expect the security issues to go away. But luckily, there are good ways to protect yourself against. And however, despite all the protection, you might need to be mentally prepared that one day somewhere some WordPress site will be hacked anyway. All right. So this is a story about a Friday a year ago. Luckily, it wasn't Friday the 13th. But anyway, it was a Friday. And since we're monitoring all of our customer sites 24 seven, we got some alerts. And it was an interesting thing because there was four sites that stopped working. So we have this monitoring that is specific for WordPress. We just don't, we, it's not enough to just ping the server that it's up. We specifically test that the WordPress site is running and, and it has, sensible content and the heartbeat is working and so on. And we got these four alerts within five minutes from four different sites. 
And this was very suspicious because all of these sites were completely separate sites and most of them were in, in separate cloud environments and clusters, but they all belonged to the same owner. So it was a news agency that owns several newspapers and, the, and four of their sites went down within five minutes. So our staff went in to look at the site. Why isn't it working as it's expected to work? And quite quickly found out that somebody had changed the site URL setting on that site. How many of you know what the site URL setting is? Some of you, yeah. How many of you are familiar with VPCLI? Here is an example of how you can use VPCLI to check out the site URL setting. So the site URL setting is a setting in WordPress which defines, which it tells to the WordPress site itself that what address is it residing at. And for some reason, all of the sites got this address updated in that setting. And obviously they stopped working because they started redirecting visitors to this address instead of their own real address. So our staff started thinking, is this maybe a mistake done by the owner of the site or the people running the site and doing the content? Because sometimes our customers break their own sites because of some mistake and we also notice those when we are monitoring the sites. But putting an address like this is not a mistake. Nobody does this by mistake. This is obviously something weird going on. And then since the owner of these four sites was the same company, we started thinking, is this some kind of targeted attack against this company? But the it could be kind of plausible, but it didn't make much sense to for an attacker to behave this way to attack a certain company, to update the setting like this. A targeted attack would be more likely to download all the data and uh, install backdoors and stuff like that. But definitely this was not done by the admins and it was not a normal fault. This was a security breach. So we have a security officer on call all the time and when our normal administrators notice that there is a security issue on a the site, then the security officer steps in and starts an investigation. And I'm going to present to you what are the steps we were following a year ago. Nowadays we have a slightly different procedure for security incidents, but I'm going to go through what we did a year ago. So the first responder notified the security officer, and the first thing to do on a site that is hacked is to save the process list so that you know what was going on, what was running at the time, at that point in time. And after that, you freeze and shut down all the processes so that whatever malicious code was running on that site can't run anymore and cause any additional harm. So basically, the site would look like this to the end users, that they were temporarily suspended from operations for the, for the entire time of the security investigation. And obviously, quite early on in the process is to notify the customer that you've noticed an issue and the sites are down on purpose. And since this was a quite special case, four sites with the same owner attacked at the same time, we decided to escalate this internally, so we got three people investigating this in parallel. Three people looking at four sites. All right. And th this was according to procedure, so this went pretty quickly, and at this time it was 11.55. All right, so when we are looking into a security issue, these are the kind of questions the investigator asks. So what's happening, and has it stopped? Because obviously you want whatever malicious is going on to stop as quickly as possible. And then after that, try to figure out what happened before 
And when did that thing start? And is there some malicious code somewhere? A backdoor planted or something else? And in general, what files have been modified and what content in the database has been modified recently? That usually is an important question. And then to some extent, trying to figure out who did it. So we almost never get out, get to find out the like human identity of who did it, but at least we can get it, find out on an IP address level where the malicious traffic and requests came from. And then once we figured out what happened on the site, then we will try to figure out how did, what was the point of entry? How did the attacker get in? And then what kind of access did they get? Did they get full admin access? Did they get, were they able to get SSH into the server? Or were, were they just able to utilize some bug in a software to get some kind of limited write access somewhere or read some small part of the site? And based on the level of access the attacker potentially gained, we can try to figure out if there is a risk that they've maybe downloaded all the data and do we have a data leak at hand and where, where there may be some personal, personal information on the site. Was it an e-commerce site with customer data and stuff? And then once we know what has happened, we can try to make conclusions on what could have been the motives of the attacker? Was this just a random attack? Was this a targeted attack? What was their goal? Were, were they specifically interested in this site? Or did they just want to get access to this site and they would, be, would have been happy to get access to any site? And are they doing something immediately? Or, or are they like uh, keeping a back door for later use? Or is this part of some kind of SEO spam campaign or are they redirecting users to some other site or what's going on? And then after this estimate what kind of damage might have been caused. So as you can see there's quite a lot of questions to figure out. And it takes some time. Right, so then about the practical steps. What was the practical procedures that we followed at this time? So the first thing is to make a new backup of the site. Why is that? Because that stores the state of the site when we took it down. So it, there will be some malicious code potentially in the backup, but it doesn't matter because we can then clean it out. But anyway, we, we store the state of the backup. And it's also very convenient because then we can use the latest backup and compare that to the previous backups and even like backups that are many weeks old or so to find out what files changed. Because sometimes attackers use techniques like uh, changing the modify time on files. So you can't rely on that to figure out what files have been recently changed. That's the M time attribute in a Linux file system. And sometimes attackers just update all the file files, do like a touch operation, all the files to also update the C time attribute in a Linux date file system. So then you can't use that either to figure out what files have been recently changed. So the backups, having backups and comparing to backups is the most reliable way to find out what files have been changed and what exactly changed in those files. So we have some tools in our system, like this vp-backup list changes, which we use. And then we use just regular Linux command line tools like diff. How many of you have been using diff on the command line? Yeah, a couple of people. Does anybody know what that dash u r does? So it shows a unified diff and that R means that it comp compares directories rec recursively. So you can ask diff that you have like directory A and directory B and then 
tell it all the differences in all files and inside those files in those directories. It's very convenient. So that will reveal changes. And you can also use diff to compare database backups if you have made the database backups in a sensible format. All right, so we did that. Then we checked what was the last WordPress logins and what was the last SSH logins, what usernames and what IP addresses did they come from? Because that usually reveals if, if a password has leaked, for example, and, and let's say it's a German site and then suddenly somebody logs in from, I don't know, like Indonesia, then that is kind of suspicious because the German site doesn't usually have logins from Indonesia. So this is kind of basic things to check out. Unfortunately, quite often the, the way somebody hacked into our customer website is that the customer's own device, like some Windows laptop or something like that, had a virus and then it leaked the, that user's passwords. So we can't really protect against that, but at least we can quickly detect it if somebody's accessing the site as an admin directly without doing any other, when it, without doing any other kind of attack before that. All right, and then here's a bunch of VPCLI commands. So if you haven't used VPCLI, I recommend you learn it. It's very convenient. Has any of you used any of these VPCLI commands on the screen? Yeah, a couple of people, yeah. So these are quite handy. So the first command, VP core verify checksums, it will tell, so it will compare it will first check what version of WordPress you have installed, like for, let's say, 5.2.4. Then it will download the checksums for that release from WordPress.org. And then it will compare the checksums of the official release and then the files you have on your file system. And if the checksums don't match, that means that there's some change in the files and there might be something like injected into your WordPress installation. And VPCLI also has a command for checking plugins in the same way. Unfortunately, there are some false positives when you are checking plugins because in the current subversion system that WordPress.org is using for plugins, it's possible for plugin authors to make uh, several releases of the same plugin using the same version number. So, you, so the checksums don't always match even if there is no backdoors. And then we also have our own slightly customized version of the checkum, checksum checker, which helps you automate that it will actually show you a diff, what was the differences on a plugin or team installed on your system and on that plugin or team at the same version in WordPress.org repositories. So here is an example of that. We ran at the WordPress checksum diff on one plugin that had a checksum change. And here is the output. So we can see that this invocation to a class method is different. But this is most likely not, or this is, we're pretty sure that this was not any kind of backdoor or injection into the code. It is just that in this case, for the same plugin release, there actually exists two releases with the same release number, and they have slightly different code. So this was a false positive. All right, and that was quite a lot of work. So at this point, it was already half past one. All right, then the next steps in our procedure is to check the user list. So as you can see, these are also VPCLI commands. That's very convenient because the site itself has been shut down, so we can't use the site, but we can use VPCLI to access everything in the, in the site. So checking at the late, latest users, you will see what new users have been registered recently. And with that other command, you can check out what new posts have been published recently. Sometimes there is some spam or something being published on the site, and that this quickly reveals it. 
And in this case, this was finally a breakthrough, because we noticed that there was, on many of these sites, there was a new user called Trollherten, or a variant of that, and it didn't look like a normal user for these sites, and it had .ru email addresses, and that was not normal for this site. So this was an interesting finding. And this actually includes the exact timestamps when those users signed up. So this was very good, because now we could use this timestamp to analyze the, the traffic logs to see what actually happened at this specific second in time. And then, after doing lo lots of analysis for the logs, we finally found out this, that this is where the entry happened. So, from the same IP address that points somewhere in Russia, somebody made a GET post on the front page, and then it made two posts to the back end, and the funny thing here is that the HTTP code from the back end was 200, so it's saying it's okay for these posts. So it shouldn't be okay, it should say access denied. And then something's going on regarding registering a user and then verifying that user, and then after that there are a couple of more requests going to the WordPress backend. So we don't know exactly what was the payload going to the backend because we're not logging post requests and we shouldn't do that either because that's kind of can be sensitive user content you're not supposed to log that but luckily we had other logs regarding what changes in php and database is happening so we found out that there was some weird empty options values in the database and unusual requests to a database table called VP GDPR C access requests. And then we just scanned all through all the code to check out what plugin is using a table with this name. And we found out this plugin, VP GDPR compliance, doing this. And at this point it was two o'clock. And then we started to look at the history of this plugin, and it turns out that one day before, or two days before, there was a new release from this plugin, and it doesn't mention any security issues in the release notes, but when we look at the code that came out in this release, there are some changes to the database calls and adding, uh, adding like uh, this quote marks. So it sounded like, was a bit fishy, sounded like a SQL injection. So we were pretty sure that this was then the point of entry. We didn't know exact mechanisms at this point, but we all the evidence pointed that this was the point of entry, a flaw in this plugin. So we deactivated and uninstalled it from all the customer sites at this point. And then it was half past two, and the US started to wake up, and security researchers in US started blogging and putting out information about stuff that they are seeing, and we noticed that other people were also experience, experiencing similar issues, and there started to come out news about this VP GDPR plugin. So the details what happened here is that this plugin had an SQL injection flaw, which made that you could update whatever option in WordPress you wanted. You didn't get full access, but you could update an option an arbitrary option. So what the attacker did, they updated the option so that anybody can register a new account and then all new accounts are admins by default. And the credits for noticing this goes to Adrian Mörschen. And this was fixed in 1.4.3. And we have this system that we are doing normal updates to our customers because we take care of the upkeep. But in addition to that, we also do urgent security updates, and when we notice that this is a security update, then we updated our, our database and made sure all of the other customers who were not yet hacked got this updated as quickly as possible. Then it was almost three o'clock, 
And based on these findings, we were pretty sure what was the point of entry, and we had answers to all of the questions we have in a security investigation. So we start could could st we're now able to remove these bad users and remove this bad plugin. And just as a safety precaution, we also reset all existing sessions and passwords in case they had somehow uh, modified the passwords or something, plant, planted the back door that way. And we also checked the logs that they have not, there was no signs that they would have been downloading the content from the site. They were just using this admin to, admin access to divert traffic to another site. So it was some kind of, I don't know what the other site would have done because it was down. So we don't know what the end motive, motive was here. And then we've cleaned up the site and then just as a security precaution, we run our own security scanner on that site to make sure there is no backdoors or malicious code. We have this system we've rolled ourselves, which we use to scan our all of the code on all of our customer sites. So it finds out patterns that are common in backdoors and malicious code, like doing shell XX and stuff like that. And then we get the, like a gray list of potentially malicious code and then our security officer then goes and reviews this and then clicks if it's good, false positive or if it's bad or we also have the option of marking it as malpractice so that we can later notify our customer that they have, it's not the hack but it's a risky code they are running. And then finally after, after almost four hours we were able to reopen the sites and have them operating normally and back online again. And then after this was done, it's not fully complete because once you open a site that has been recently hacked, then you need to have an elevated monitoring on it, on it to see if you're still getting the same kind of attack or was there some other kind of attack and just like verify that what you think was the point of entry actually was the point of entry and the site doesn't get hacked again through some other mean. And also a very important part of the process is to constantly notify the, the owner of the site what's going on. And in total we sent like eight email updates during this process to the customer to notify where, where, it, where it's going so it, the customer don't think that we're not doing anything. And when we notify the customer what we found, the customer actually noticed themselves that they've got on the previous day a new user registration email from WordPress about these new accounts, but nobody just paid attention, so they ignored it. And you can't really blame anybody because that's not something that people who are just using WordPress sites, they, you can't expect them to realize immediately that the new user registration sometimes means that there was an attack. And, and most importantly, it turned out that this was not a targeted attack against this customer. They were just very unlucky that they had this plugin on all of their four sites because they had the same builder on the sites. And this plugin had a zero day vulnerability and it happened to get utilized on all of them at the same time. So in conclusion, so no plugin author makes perfect code and sometimes you will have zero day vulnerabilities. That means that there is a security issue in the plugin and there is no chance of updating, fixing it by updating the plugin yet. And Therefore, there is always a chance that at some point your site could get hacked. So in addition to having the security measures, I recommend that you also have some kind of procedure figured out in advance what you will do if the site actually gets hacked someday. Thank you. Yeah, and 
then I guess we have a couple of minutes of time for questions. Anyone? Uh, thanks a lot for your very interesting presentation. Um, what, in addition to the last uh, slide, what would you think are the main additional lessons learned? And the second uh, question is, uh, yes, it is unreasonable for site admins to read each and every notification. However, I would have expected uh, to put more um, emphasis on, on changes in the admin accounts. So why didn't they notice that admin uh, accounts were added? I guess it doesn't really help that the the text in those emails could have been better, but I don't think that ultimately would help because people are just getting too many emails. So they probably wouldn't notice, and even if they would notice, it's kind of unreasonable for them to notice it immediately and do the proper response. So I wouldn't blame the customer in this case. I think that, yeah. And also the customer here kind of tried to do everything correctly. It's, and it's kind of ironic that the security issue was in a plugin dev installed because of security and privacy reasons itself. You could also ask, does it make sense to have this kind of setting in the WordPress core that you can make all new users by default administrators? That should maybe be prevented. I don't know any valid use case for that. Other questions? So in the starting you mentioned that you got the notification from your systems that the site had been breached or there was some issue with the sites. So are you using some kind of custom uh, monitoring tool or this is some then you're, what are the monitoring tools you're using for that? Yeah, so the question was, what are the monitoring tools we are using to notice this, that are the sites working or not? So we have our own, so we are using lots of open source software, so we're not coding everything ourselves, but we are doing all of the integration and glue and lots of customizations ourselves. So what we're using here to monitor on these sites is not something that you, you can have your yourself at the moment. But uh, yeah, and that's also because of monitoring the sites is kind of embedded in, into our service, what we do as an upkeep company. But uh, there's lots of online services out there doing where you can very cheaply buy monitoring if you, if that's something you want to do yourself. I don't have any specific to recommend, but I know there are there are even free ones where you can have small amount of sites monitored. Um, another question: um, Do you always try to repair the WordPress sites, or what? Where's the limit? I uh, I had intruders. They I, I uh, saw them after some hours. Uh, they were on my site, so it was all the night. And they changed a lot of things. They changed options. They uploaded files. They changed so much. I, I just uh, put in uh, a backup. I restored the backup, and that helped me. I had to check where was it was also a plugin. Uh, I had to remove that one, but but for the to repair the content, I just uh, used the backup. Yeah. So that's our guarantee that if the site gets hacked while we do the upkeep, then we will clean up, clean it up. So we're not an insurance company. We won't pay you any damages or anything like that, but we will stand for our own uh, like staff costs for the extra work involved in cleaning up your site. And we can analyze what changes have been done to the site, to the detail, and revert those changes, or we can just revert to the backup, and we can like selectively revert, like we can revert all the files to the backup, but not the database, or we can revert parts of the database to the backup, and we have tools for that. So it's possible for us to to revert to backups 
fully or partially to get all all uh, un, unauthorized modifications out of the site. Yeah, first of all, thanks for the presentation. Thanks. It was really uh, useful. So, yeah. So my question is probably the, uh, a little bit the same as Zomir said. How we can prevent those situations? Actually, uh, what we were talking about is something that already happened, but since the problem was uh, from the. WordPress plugins and commons and code. So, is there a way to <laughs> prevent these things from happening? Yeah. So, from from our as as from our company point of view, as daily operations, we're doing quite a lot of things to prevent this. Because obviously, if a site gets hacked, it's very expensive for us, and we won't make any any income from that customer. For the, for the payments, our work to clean up a site is al always more expensive than what the customer is paying, paying us. So we have an incentive to have all kinds of protections in place. And we are doing most of the protections outside of WordPress on like C code level before anything even reaches WordPress. But that's not something you can, that's too complex for, for, for average people to, to replicate. But I would like to point out that there is lots and lots of false WordPress security advice out there. So you need to take those security advice with a grain of salt or maybe a bowl of salt. And I really recommend checking out this presentation, WordPress Security 101, because here I try to debunk what is the stuff that is false advice, what you should not do, and what is the actual things you as a WordPress site owner should take care of. Yeah, thank you. Some of you were here in the earlier talk about performance, and one of one of my recommend recommendation regarding both performance and security is that you should use some kind of managed WordPress hosting company. Use us or some of the other companies that are also sponsors here today, because that will take away quite a lot of like the basic chores and headaches regarding owning a WordPress site, so then you can focus on the content and development of the site itself. Um, two questions. Can you hear me? Yeah. That's not the question. <laughs> uh, so uh, the assumption is this was not a targeted attack. And I was wondering, uh, did you just out of curiosity maybe check the IP address if they attacked also on, others, uh, on other installations you manage? but didn't succeed. So just to verify, okay, this was random. Because he had it on four different sites, so it was like, it should appear on a lot of, probably then. And then a lot of uh, WordPress um, hosters or something, they have like blacklists for plugins they don't allow for specific reasons. And with your policy to say, okay, we recover you, uh, do you have such policies in place uh, just to minimize your risk? Yeah, so we have a we have a policy that all of our optimizations and performance optimizations and security, or at least 95% of that is done on a C code level outside of PHP and outside of WordPress. So you can bring a like whatever WordPress site you want to us. But we have a recommendation that if you move a site to us, then you should remove all backup plugins, all performance and caching plugins, and all security plugins, because we take care of that. And if you have that yourself, you're just doing duplicate work and slowing down the site. And also you are increasing the attack surface because the more you have plugins, the more there is potentially vulnerable code running on your site. So this is a soft policy, but customers, if they want, they can run those plugins. And so that your question, you had two questions. One was about this plugin policy. So we have a soft policy that you, we don't recommend that and you don't need that. And the second question was about this IP address. Uh, did it attack other sites? So this IP address actually is a known uh, bad actor, and we've been sharing this IP address with other security, with, with, with security companies in the field. But uh, it's really difficult to like the problem with this is with internet is that when you're attacking, you can just hop on many nodes. And 
in this case, this node points to Russia, and it kind of makes it likely that the attacker was not Russian, because it doesn't make sense to use the last node in your own country. Because then if the police gets a f report to your country, then you will get caught. It's much better to hop like through 10 different countries, and it will take 10 years for the jurisdictions to do all the paperwork to to do all the checkups and all the logs have been deleted by they get get to that point and so on. But the, yeah, um, so kind of related to your question about this, so we have a system in place that if we have get too many, we have like an internal blacklist of IP addresses that if we're, if we're seeing too much bad traffic from them, then we block them out from our our network completely. Uh, thank you for your uh, presentation. Um, I'm wondering, you're luckily in the position uh, that you have access to all these logs and you can analyze it because you're the hoster. Uh, Can you recommend uh, tools to do this if you are on a shared hosting um, and a uh, not so lucky uh, user and in the position to 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 find these informations without those access to those logs? Yeah, so I, I need to say what the previous speaker also said that if you're if you're like running on free hosting or very cheap hosting, if you're paying less than 20 euros a month, then you're like already screwed. <laughs> so you, you can't have any expectations at that level. So you should, you should make sure that whatever, whatever solution you have for running your site, then it, it like includes like proper logging. Yeah. And for tools, well, we use lots of like, you need to have SSH access to your site. That's like, in my opinion, like the minimum feature And in many shared hosting environments, you don't even have SSH access, so that's already a no-no. And then when you have SSH access, then you can use standard Linux tools like rsync to get the logs and grep and sed and sort and stuff like that to analyze the logs. We don't have any fancy tools for that because it's just like there are so many ways that the like the attacks can go so so you need to kind of manually adjust what you're looking for from t from from case to case I hope you're using SSH so yeah so that that's the primary tool you need to learn SSH and Linux command line that gets you a long way Thank you.